Mode. Hello everyone, good, mean, good morning, good afternoon and good evening, depending on where in the world you're joining us today. Uh, welcome to the fourth webinar of the Asia-Pacific GPPL Network. Uh, my name is Laura Scott and I work as a consultant for the Sustainable Public Procurement Team in Paris at the UN Environment. Uh, before we start, I will give you a brief introduction to the GoToWebinar tool. So all attendees are on listen-only mode throughout the webinar. Um, if throughout the webinar you have a remark or you want to ask a question to one of the presenters, you can write your question in the question box on your right uh, of your screen, and we will read them in due time during the question and answer session in the end. Uh, this webinar will also be recorded, and the recording will be made available to you after the webinar. We will post it to the, on the FCP Clearinghouse YouTube channel. So without further delay, I would like to give the floor to Fred Yaka, Program Officer in charge of the SPP program at UN Environment. Thank you, Laura, and welcome everyone. Okay, we will first uh, introduce the UNEP SPP activities in relation uh, in particular to the Asia Pacific Green Public Procurement and Eco Labeling network so just to uh, give you an idea of our activity at world level we have activities that are concentrating on specific countries through specific projects in particular we have the spp and eco labeling uh, project the aap green project which focus on uh, certain regions of the world so eap green focuses on eastern europe SPPEL on Latin America, Africa, and Asia. And through this project, we provide policy support and technical assistance to countries for the design and implementation of SPP and eco labeling policies. We have also regional activities, and this is the case with uh, the network in which this seven webinar is organized today. Uh, I'm naming the GPP and eco labeling Asia Pacific Network that was established in 2013. Our uh, second focus is uh, global through what we call the 10 YFP SPP program, which stands for 10 year framework of programs on sustainable consumption and production. And we're managing within this framework, we're managing the SPP program. UNEP is the lead of the SPP program of this global framework. And in this, through this program, we wish to promote worldwide implementation of SPP, notably by increasing collaboration, cooperation between key stakeholders, and also making sure that we have a better understanding of the potential benefits and impacts of sustainable procurement. So I mentioned uh, our national activities. I told you that it was done through uh, two main programs, SPP EL and EEP Green Project. You can see in blue, the SPPEL project in green, the AP Green project in Eastern Europe. In terms of uh, updates at, uh, in Asia, so you saw that we were working in, in two countries, Mongolia and Vietnam. I welcome our uh, attendees coming from these two countries. In Mongolia, we're uh, implementing our approach, which is called the UNEP SPP approach, as in all the countries. And in uh, we have reached the, the stage, we have completed the market analysis and the action plan is in progress. In uh, Vietnam, we are uh, working on eco-labeling and on sustainable public procurement because Vietnam is considered to be what we call a core country because they have an eco-labeling scheme in place. So in these countries, we have completed the SWOT analysis of the eco-labeling scheme. We have also achieved the prioritization and have done the legal review to uh, check if the, the legal framework was conducive with to uh, green public procurement to see what kind of improvement could be brought to the uh, legal law on to the law on uh, green public procurement. We are also completing the market analysis to check if the, the market is ready, is able to provide uh, green goods that could be procured by the government. 
So this is ongoing. And we are also developing eco-labeling criteria for a group of products that were prioritized, photocopy machines, LED lights, and solar cells. I will now, now hand over to my colleague, Laura, who will mention the, the regional progress uh, in Asia Pacific. Good morning, everyone. Uh, this is Laura Guccione speaking. I'm also part of the SPELL project team, mostly focusing on the activities uh, that have to do with eco-labeling. So the Asia Pacific regional component of the SPELL project um, has been uh, doing some progress. We have now um, launched the report on the key opportunities for pilot products with policies and challenges for the Asia Pacific region. Um, if you're interested to know more about this report, it's available on the new SCP Clearinghouse. But just to give you a short outline, the, pro the report focuses on the identification of potential pilot products for the development of common core criteria. Common core criteria for us is the set of green technical criteria for a given product. And this criteria can be used uh, for public and private procurement, for standards, and for also for eco-labels. The objective of developing uh, the common core criteria is actually facilitating the adoption of um, public procurement practices, as well as mutual recognition agreements for eco-labels. So this report actually uh, undertook an evaluation of the products based on different criteria, including the potential to reduce environmental impacts, the relevance for GPP and trade in the region, the existing common core criteria that already is present in the region and what work is already being done, and also on the existing mutual recognition agreements among eco-labels. So just to show you some results of the um, analysis, um, there's three products that have been considered the top priorities, taking into consideration economic, environmental, and political uh, policy aspects in the region. So the prioritized products are fluorescent lamps, detergent, and printers. Uh, we can see from this chart that there is a wide availability of these products among uh, countries that have eco-labels type 1. And there are also product categories that have been considered priorities for public procurement. So um, right now, uh, we are analyzing this report to design uh, future activities for the region. And um, this will likely include knowledge, knowledge sharing and uh, activities to promote the progress on development of common core criteria in the region. And we will keep you informed uh, when these activities are defined and the dates as well. Thank you, Laura. We are now present, we're now going to present in more details the Green Public Procurement and Eco Labeling Project, which is supported by the Ministry of Environmental Protection of China and the Korea Environmental Industry and Technology Institute. So, the objectives of this project, which took place from 2010 13 to 2016, we're about to, to end. We hope that the first phase of this project were to strengthen SPP and eco-labeling in the Asia-Pacific region, based on the expertise of China, Japan, and South Korea, the more advanced countries. And then we added Thailand, and the experience will be also, uh, I think, presented uh, by GIZ in, in the next presentation. It was also to enhance South-South collaboration on those topics, and we achieved a very high level of collaboration between among ASEAN countries notably, to ensure a broad and effective participation of Asia-Pacific countries in the activities of the 10-year framework on sustainable public procurement program that uh, I mentioned earlier is led by UNEP at global level. In terms of activities, what has been achieved, we have managed to set up our Asia-Pacific network. We had yearly network meetings from 2013 to uh, 2016. In, uh, we also changed the name over the course of the project to Asia Pacific GPP AEL Network. I think that was done in 2015. We have and I invite you to join an Asia Pacific GPPL forum on LinkedIn. We have a mailing list, so what we consider to be uh, members 
of the network of 222 contacts in Asia Pacific that are regularly receiving information on those two areas. <clears throat> we have also been able to develop a number of uh, case studies and also a comparative analysis that will be uh, presented today, a benchmarking study uh, on uh, the, the more advanced countries and their performance on green public procurement and eco-labeling. So we have four studies that were developed uh, earlier in 2015 on China, South Korea, Japan and Thailand in collaboration with the OECDs. And we're just about to release six case studies from also the more advanced countries. And this will be published at the end of this year over in the next days, in a few days or early uh, 2017. <clears throat> we are also established, we have established good and strong links with the 10-wave PSPP program. We have created subgroups in Asia and a number of uh, Asian uh, uh, organizations and, and, and uh, uh, officials and experts have been able to join uh, the international working groups of the 10 YFP. And last but not least, we have organized high level uh, trainings. For example, in 2015 in Kuala Lumpur, we had trainings on the experience of more advanced countries of the region. This year, we just finished a training in Beijing on the experience of non-Asian countries on uh, GPP and eco-labeling. So this has been also uh, quite successful. This is in a, you see the very fresh image of the, the participants in the training of uh, Beijing, which was hosted by uh, the Ministry of Environmental Protection and the Center of Environmental Certification. So here you see the the content, I'm not going to, to, to go into those details, but the presentation will be, of course, shared with you. Here are the, the, the list of participants. We had 43 participants from 10 countries at this training. We have to note that we had 11 participants from Chinese municipalities also that took part in the training. And we had very interesting uh, and positive feedback. Sanjay Kumar said that during the training, many new concepts emerged from experiences of countries who are already participating in SPP for many years. This concept could be contextualized and implemented in his country, rich discussions with experts, good mix of participants who contributed to peer learning. Zhang Xiaodan, who is the general manager from CEC MEP China, said that there was good communication, good sharing, lots of information and good experiences. We had also from Hong Kong, uh, remarked that it was cross-fertilization. There were there was cross-fertilization amongst delegates, trendy topics, interactive learning, good mix of speakers and delegates. So this gives you an idea about the, the training and we hope to continue this program in the next years. How can you participate in the network? The project is uh, for the moment uh, coming to an end, but the network uh, continues and, and, and will be expanded hopefully in the future. So please, uh, look at this information and if you're interested, feel free to, to join either through the LinkedIn or by writing to us. So here are the, the addresses that you can use to contact us. We really look forward to, to hearing from you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed to both uh, Farid Yaka and Laura Guccione. I will now give the floor to Ms. Kanchanasese Vasovac, who is going to uh, introduce us to the activities of GIZ in the Asia-Pacific region. Questions. And if you have any questions, you're of course uh, welcome to write them in the question box, just as we mentioned in the beginning. And now for the GIZ and also good evening. My name is Kanchaneti Wasuwat from GIZ Bangkok. And please call me Yim, it's more easier for you. Um, today, I, I would like to first thank you for the UNEP that invite us for present and share our activity in the 2016 uh, under the um, GPP and eco Labouring Vortex. Next, please. Next, please. 
Okay, is this a directly outline that today we'll, uh, I will present about the GSET and at one SAP projects and also the activity in the year 2016. Next, please. Just for the um, information, uh, sorry, the, the previous one. <laughs> I will roughly talk about the GIZ first, just in case the, some participants don't know about us. GIZ provides a service worldwide in the fields of uh, international cooperation for sustainable development. GIZ has over 50, 50 years of the experience in the wide varieties of the area, including the um, economic development and employment, energies and the environment and peace and securities. The German Federal Ministry for Economic Cooperation and Development, or BMZ, and also the, um, the Federal Ministry for the Environment, Nature, Conservation, Buildings, and Nuclear Safety, BMUB, are our main commissioning party, but we also work with the private sector, uh, fostering successful interaction between developed policies and the uh, foreign trade. The register office of the GSZ are in Bonn and Eschborn of our around 18,000 staff in over 130 countries and around 70% are national personal working in the field. Next please. Um, the Advanced AC Pre Project. Um, we try to put in the easy way for the people who can remember our project's name, but the full names of the project is uh, Advancing and Measuring Sustainable Consumption and Production for a Low Carbon Economy in Middle Income and Newly Industrial Countries. Next, please. Which in this project we funded by the Federal Ministry for the Environment, Nature, Conservation, Buildings, and Nuclear Safety is a BMUB, and we implementing with the UNEP, but we separate um, the country. JSI will taking care for country in Southeast Asia, include um, Indonesia, Malaysia, Philippines, and Thailand. UNEP will taking care another two country in Latin America and two countries in Africa. Under the GIZ, our project starts since uh, July 2015 and will until the, um, June 2018. Next, please. In these years, our projects also had um, the activities that relate to the GPP and also the eco levelings. Next, please. The biggest um, conference that we already organized in September this year in Chiang Rai, Thailand, this is the, um, the extended Southeast so Asian conference on the GPP and eco level as promoter for innovation qualifications and green transformations. It is organized from 28 to 30 September in Chiang Rai, just a few months, is hosted by BMUB Germany and organized by GIZ. The conference, which to be the platform for information exchange and experience sharing that can lead to cooperation on the varieties of the topics in, relate, in relation to policy, strategies, and tools for green transformation. During the event with more than 30 participants from the government agency, in the governmental agency, national eco leveling program implementer, research institutes, private company um, manufacturer, and also the interested organization from 15 developed, developing and late developed countries participate in the event. Um, next day, after the hour, uh, during the um, conference, um, next slide please. We also had another two ceremony on the um, MRA signings. This is the mutual recognition agreement signing ceremony in Chiang Rai, Thailand. 
First is the signing ceremony of mutual recognition agreement between Thailand Green Label and Syrian Eco Label Malaysia. The signings of the documents was undertaken by the Professor Dr. Tanawat, the President of the TEI, Thailand Environmental Institute, and Mr. Basori bin Salamat, the Senior General Manager of the Product Certifications and Inspection Department of Syrian QAR International. The agreement is the first step of the cooperation between two eco labeling program on the recognition of the post both party certification processes and allow them to perform veri verifications on behalf of each other. The next one is this um, signing ceremony of the Memorandum of Understanding on Imaging Equipment Printers and Copiers common criteria between Japan Ecomark and Thailand Green Label. This um, was undertaken by Mr. Takayuki Honma from Japan Environmental Association's Ecomark's office and Pro Professor Dr. Tanawat from TEI. In this event, we had the invitant by Dr. Uf Yako, head of the Division Federation Ministry for the Environment, National Conservation Building and Nuclear Safety BMUB and also the country director of GSF Thailand, Mr. Hemming, in this event. Next, please. Next, please. Okay. Um, after that, during the 31st of October to 4th of November, Putan projects, uh, GPP Putan projects, um, quite interest to learn and study about the GPP and Ecolabel in Thailand. So they approached the GIZ to organize the, um, the trip, the study trip in Thailand to meet the government and also the GPP, oh, sorry, the TEI for learn and study from us. During those time is a one week. We bring them to visit the several Thai government and non-government agency who is involved in the GPP and eco labeling for exposures and let them familiar about the SPP and the SCP practice. The list of the organization that we bring them to visit. This is the Ministry of um, National Resources and Environment, Pollution Control Department, Thailand, and also the Office of Natural Resources and Environmental Policy and Planning, ONEP, who taking care about the projects between the international projects in Thailand, and the EQP, the Department of Environment Quality Pro Promotion, and Thailand Greenhouse Gas Management, TGO, and Thai Environment Institute, TI. And we also bring them to see how to, um, how to management of the waste water in the, um, another province nearby Bangkok by Sahapat Industrial Park. They bring them to to show their system about the water waste management and also the ASEAN Institute of uh, Technology and uh, SCG CMCMN group. Next, please. The next workshop that just passed from last month in November, we organized the um, regional capacity buildings at the uh, in the Port Dixon in Malaysia. The supported by the initial findings of the baseline study of uh, GGP and GPP and the inclusions of the climate friendly criteria in the eco level product criteria document development. The common and important factor to be practiced is the measurement of uh, CO2 emission. On that note, that's why we try to organize um, this workshop in Malaysia, which the which of uh, economic planning unit, Prime Minister Department, EPUPMD Malaysia, and at one 
SVP projects with the expert from ECO Institute besides the workshop to train and share the knowledge with the participants on methodologies in calculating carbon emission and conducting life cycle costing on certain product groups. The objectives of the training is this, we would like the participant able to measure the carbon emission of non-electrical product for green public procurement implementation and also to understand the um, LCC, the life cycle costing for construction work, which focusing on the energy consume, uh, consume measurable applications. We had um, 35 participants from Malaysia, Indonesia, Philippines, and also in Thailand for three day trainings. And yeah, is this the um, the activities that focus on the GPP and eco-leveling from the ADVAN SCP projects. Next, please. And thank you for listening. We have, we still keep doing the some activity plan in the next years and until the 2018, but if uh, Anyone would like to know more in details about the report of uh, those workshop that already finished, you can send me the email and um, say that you're interested, I can share. Thank you. Thank you very much, Him, for your presentation. I'm now giving the floor back to Fareed Yaka. And also thank you Im, for a very interesting presentation and, and great work uh, achieved by GAZ. And Im was actually in, in Beijing also and the training, and it will be interesting to have you. I'd like uh, to present now one of the outputs from the GPPL project, which is a benchmarking or comparative analysis of GPP and eco labeling practices in China, Japan, South Korea, and Thailand. Before that, I'd like to thank Milis Norkin for having uh, prepared those slides, and I think she did a, a great job. And also those that uh, really all contributed to this. Uh, report you will find it will be released in a few days or so, so please check the acknowledgement and you will see that uh, a number of people uh, participated in uh, drafting the study and among them uh, i think the main author was uh, sonal parasnis from um, she's based in hong kong we had also good contribution from uh, a colleague tim reeve who is in in vancouver who did also some uh, a lot of uh, editing of the report of course, our UN environment teams and uh, the team is mainly from the countries, which are uh, China, Japan, South Korea, and Thailand. So I will present, uh, I will focus this presentation on uh, key aspects of the study, the policy framework, the GPP criteria, and uh, their link with eco-labeling, GPP implementation and support measures, the monitoring systems that are in place, environmental and economic benefits of GPP, and then what we perceived to be common success factors of those policies. So GPP implementation in these four countries is, has been uh, promoted independently from uh, each other, and they are really based on uh, the local context, the local situations, the legal framework of those countries. But despite this, we found that there are striking similarities between uh, those four countries. And uh, we tried to compel, compile sorry, these similarities, but also looked at the differences. So in terms of uh, policy framework, you can see on your screen that uh, Japan, Korea, and Thailand have an overarching, overarching sorry, GPP uh, framework. They have a specific policy or legal frameworks regarding the promotion of uh, GPP. China does not have a single umbrella, fr umbrella framework for GPP. However, Ministry of Finance and Ministries of Environmental Protection have enacted regulations for the promotion of environmental labeling products. In terms of eco-labeling schemes, you can see that the four countries have eco-labeling schemes type 1, which means that they are based on a product life cycle 
uh, and they are looking at the impact over the life cycle of the product. You can see that this, this, they were in, uh, put in place um, a number of years ago, the oldest one in Japan, and uh, then uh, we had uh, Korea, China and Thailand uh, that followed. In terms of uh, leading GPP implementation, we always have a, a ministry which is uh, the champion of uh, GPP implementation. In most cases, it's the Ministry of Environment, but it's really closely associated and done in good coordination with other ministries and among them ministries of finance, which is also playing a key role in the implementation of those policies. In terms of uh, existence of goals and targets, China has no uh, global target sets. However, we have in Japan and the Republic of Korea, we have uh, the targets that they set for each ministry and agencies, and they have to report the achievements to uh, the Ministry of Environment every fiscal year. In Thailand, green public procurement is carried out on a voluntary basis, but they have set specific targets for uh, green procurement that concern that are concentrating on the increase of government spending on environmentally preferably products, and also on the number of departments that are implementing uh, green public procurement. In terms of uh, enforcement level, so GPP is mandatory for all central government agencies in Japan. In China, it is mandatory for certain designated product categories. In uh, Korea, we have, by uh, in the, the Act of 2005, obliged the uh, ministries and, and public agencies to submit a green public procurement implementation plan for the year and also performance records for the previous, previous year. In China, I mentioned that uh, it was mandatory and it's the case for uh, some categories and mainly the one uh, that are linked to the energy conservation product labels. So we have a list that are uh, put together by the government and uh, all the products that are included in this list of ECP are mandatory for procurement by central governments. Whereas the products that are included in a second list of what we call environmental labeling products, ELP, is voluntary. In Thailand, the law encourages procurement of environmentally friendly products, so it's not mandatory and green public procurement is conducted then on a voluntary basis by central government agencies. In terms of uh, GPP criteria and their link with eco-labeling, green public procurement is, and the, the, the criteria are based mainly on the environmental attributes of the product. However, uh, in Thailand, the economic aspects aspects are also considered. In China, it's called green procurement, but social aspects are also including, included, sorry, especially labor and safety issues, in addition to economic aspects. In terms of uh, the development of uh, the GPP criteria, eco-labeling schemes are used as a technical basis for green public procurement programs in all the four countries. And here on the screen, you see the uh, eco-labeling schemes that are being uh, used to develop GPP criteria. So in China, I mentioned already the energy conservation label, the environmental labeling scheme. In Japan, we have the EcoMark. In Korea, Korea EcoLabel, Recycled Mark, and other uh, standards. In Thailand, the green card or the Thai green label, and also the green leaf. So you see that you have a number of eco-labels that are really used to develop GPP criteria. All countries have prioritized some product categories for green public procurement. You can see 
the, those that are common to all four countries, for example, paper and stationery, IT equipment, household appliances, uh, cleaning services, vehicles, furniture, lighting. In, uh, and then we have some that are more specific to some countries. For example, we have construction materials, textile products, accommodation, lubricant oils, fire extinguishers, fixtures, paint, printing services that are uh, very often specific to some countries. In terms of centralized or non-centralized procurement, public procurement uh, schemes or uh, setups and how it affects the implementation of sustainable uh, procurement. In China, we have a semi-centralized semi uh, public procurement. It means that sometimes it's, the procurement is done at the central level and sometimes it's done at the, the local level, provinces or, or municipalities. In Japan, it's decentralized. In Korea, it's also semi-centralized. So above certain thresholds, it's conducted by the central purchasing agencies, PPS. And in Thailand, it's decentralized. So uh, what does it mean? When it's centralized, it means that we have a broader uh, implementation, larger scope for of public procurement. So we have higher uh, volumes and uh, more important uh, contracts. And this means that if we introduce environmental or social criteria, we can have a higher impact when central government is supportive of uh, sustainable purchasing. When it decentralizes, it can be also positive because more authorities, more public authorities will be uh, willing to implement SPP or in case it gives more opportunities to uh, center, to local authorities to implement SPP. So it also can be a positive factor. In terms of capacity building, as you can imagine, all four countries engage in capacity building act activities to ensure that their uh, procurers are uh, updated and, and trained on sustainable uh, procurement. So in each country, it's mainly the responsibility of the lead agency to provide training for procurement staff in applying green public procurement policies and, and practices. In Japan, along with the, the governmental agency, the Green Purchasing Network, which is a, a federation of, uh, well, it's supported by industry, but also uh, uh, NGOs and local authorities, but in itself it's a not-for-profit organization. This uh, green purchasing network provides additional training for procurers. In terms of incentives, which is also a key point, we have reputational incentives and we have economic incentives. In China, we don't have reputational incentives. However, price subsidies are put in place to encourage uh, public offices to purchase uh, green vehicles. In Korea, we have annual performance, uh, annual performance bonuses uh, that are uh, given to public institutions and local governments, depending on the, the level of uh, green procurement. Korea has also an award system which is uh, organized and set up by the Ministry of Environment, which is it's based on uh, and uh, operates as a reputational incentive for organizations or individuals that are contributing to the development of ecological technology and industry. And in Thailand, we have also uh, award systems that are in place. In terms of the monitoring, of GPP implementation, which is really important because we have to uh, measure those policies and we cannot really improve and uh, get the, the, the support from policy uh, makers if we're not able to measure uh, how much of GPP, how much of procurement is green and what is uh, the impact of these uh, green policies. So in Japan, I mean, all countries except uh, China have established monitoring systems for green public procurement. And uh, it's organized in a way that all public agencies have to report their results back to the main implementing agencies. 
I also mentioned the how much green public procurement was done, but also the impact of those policies and impact is also measured in terms of uh, CO2 emissions reductions. So countries have put in place measurement schemes to measure the savings on CO2 emissions. And you have that on the screen. In China, environmental benefits are also estimated for specific product categories. I'd like to finish with uh, a slide on what we perceive to be common success factors in those four countries. We found that a strong legal framework and central government, government support was essential to ensure the success of those policies. Clear product criteria simplify GPP process and accelerate implementation across agencies. Eco-labeling schemes are very important to really support the GPP processes and uh, especially for uh, to ensure uh, provide a great means of verification for procurement staff and, their, and they also then promote uh, green markets. Important, of course, to build the capacity of procurement staff to communicate and promote those policies. And as I just mentioned, it's important to monitor the systems to ensure positive social and environmental impacts, but also uh, a buy-in from decision makers. Thank you very much. And uh, the, of course, you will receive the, the study in a, in a few weeks. We are right, working now on the, on the graphic design. And uh, of course, it will be released and you will be informed. Thanks all. Thank you very much for this presentation, Farid. I'm now going to um, tell you about the um, case studies from our compendium of green public procurement, which was mentioned uh, earlier uh, by Farid uh, when he presented the uh, GPPL um, activities. So the compendium uh, includes six case studies in total. Um, it's case studies that come from four different countries, um, namely Thailand, Japan, Korea, and China. Unfortunately, we will not have the time to go through each one of them. So I'm just going to focus on, on two of them, so two out of the six. So the first case study I would like to present um, focuses on the procurement of green Flexo ink uh, for the packaging by the Siam Cement Group in Thailand. Um, so to give you a bit of background on the state of GPP in Thailand, uh, the Royal Thai government approved the first green public procurement promotion plan back in 2008, which targeted about 170 central government agencies and departments. And it wasn't until 2012 that it launched a second uh, GPP promotion plan, which this time extended its uh, coverage to also private organizations as well. And within these also private public partnerships and public, uh, sorry, public as well as private sector uh, companies. Um, so the CM Cement Group is the largest cement company in Thailand. In 2011, it was actually ranked as the second largest company in Thailand. And it has three core business units. Uh, so it's chemicals unit, it's packaging, and lastly, it's cement building materials unit. Um, it has also a long history of committing to sustainability. Uh, in fact, it started its green procurement program back in 2004 by committing to purchasing only from suppliers that were environmentally friendly. And to implement this program, uh, this green procurement policy, uh, it set up a green procurement committee, um, which was in charge together with the various business units uh, to develop the uh, first green procurement guidelines that were ever published in Thailand. Um, which also included purchasing criteria for specific products and services. And still today, um, the CN Cement Group uh, uh, adopts an approach that is based on what it calls the three Gs, being the green products, green processes, and green mines. So the first two are quite straightforward to understand. The last one refers to basically a general raising, raising of awareness about environmental issues among its uh, employees, as well as other stakeholders involved in production processes. Um, so the case study focuses in particular on the uh, packaging unit of the CM Cement Group. Um, so solid waste management has been and is still an issue, uh, a very challenging environmental issue for Thailand. And one of the major sources of solid waste comes from packages, 
packaging industry. Um, so knowing these facts helps putting the relevance of the sector into perspective and also to understand its importance, as well as, as the relevance of this case study in particular. Uh, so flexographic ink is the major raw material used in the packaging production, and it can have very large environmental uh, impacts due to the chemical content uh, of the ink. Um, so the CM Cement Group set up criteria for the um, ink that it, it uses in a printing process and has also developed an audit procedure to check that the suppliers of this raw material also comply with this criteria that have been set. Um, so the suppliers are evaluated on the basis of a mental impact throughout the whole life cycle of the product. Uh, and what is interesting is that on top of that, the CS Cement Group also provides knowledge, advice and motivation to improve environmental management system of its suppliers. And also uh, this way to enhance also the level of compliance with the, with the standard detail set. Um, so uh, now we're going to have a look at the different phases that, um, that the uh, evaluation of suppliers uh, is composed of. Um, so the first phase is the pre-visit. And during this phase, uh, the um, representative of the of the CM Cement Group uh, carry out a visit to the uh, supply site to sort of understand what the um, baseline with regard to current practices related to environmental and safety issues is. Um, and these issues, the issues that they focus on, are mainly related to the management of chemical substances, the management of water, uh, water of wastewater, as well as that of solid waste. Uh, the second phase consists in uh, setting up evaluation criteria for which are the products that are purchased from each supplier uh, that take into account the product life cycle. So they take into account both whatever comes before, during and after the production of, of, the, of the final product, uh, as well as its disposal. Um, and it also takes in, into account the general commitment commitment of the supplier company uh, with regard to environmental and sustainability issues. Uh, the third phase is the audit. So the supplier um, get, has gets a score assigned, basically, um, depending on how well they perform with regard to each uh, standard that has been uh, set by the CN Cement Group. So you can get uh, three different scores. So it's, they can either pass, so if they get a score from 81 to 100%, uh, so that means that they are uh, officially registered as uh, suppliers uh, for the CM Cement Group. They can they are eligible to for the bidding process. Uh, then, if they get a B, uh, they pass. They are also eligible, but they uh, will be monitored closely in the uh, following months. And if they get less than sixty one percent, they uh, they are not uh, admitted uh, straight away but they are invited to improve the practices uh, through the, um, uh, thanks to the help provided by the CN Cement Group itself, uh, which corresponds to the fourth phase, so the course consultation and training. So if the supplier does not pass the audit, experts from the CN Cement Group give recommendations regarding ways to improve uh, their performance uh, with regard to the uh, deficiencies that have been identified during the audit pro process. And uh, then the fifth phase consists in the re-audit. Um, so, of course, this is to evaluate whether the, uh, the supplier has improved its practices and has corrected them according to the suggestions provided by the experts. And lastly, there is a final registration in the green product list uh, when suppliers have managed to finally um, comply with all the requirements set. Um, so um, this program has led to major improvements uh, for the supplies of uh, flexographic ink with regards to both raw material to the management of waste and wastewater, as well as the uh, management of uh, resource and waters, uh, water resources. And of course, it's also led to benefits for the environment and society as a whole, uh, in particular to reduce use of resources and energy consumption, also reduction in the use of toxic substances, reduction in waste, and in general, it has supported a more environmentally friend friendly um, approach to the production of flexographic ink. Um, and 
In this graph, you can see the really remarkable increase in GPP that has resulted from the um, green procurement uh, program. Um, so you can see that in 2014, the amount of green procurement accounted um, for 233 million US dollars. Um, so with regard to the challenges uh, that the CM Cement Group had to overcome to achieve this result, uh, first of all, is a challenge that consists in having to raise awareness uh, throughout the product life cycle. So basically, having to engage with all the stakeholders involved um, to raise awareness about uh, the importance of sustainability issues. And to overcome this challenge, the CN Cement Group had to develop strategies to encourage the stakeholders along the whole product life cycle um, to um, develop a shared and a shared vision of uh, sustainable development for the future. Um, also, another challenge was uh, represented by the fact that the government green procurement policy does not currently include a list that is adapted to each sector of the economy, including the private sector. So therefore, the CM Cement Group had to develop its own solution for green procurement in line with their own organization's policy in, the area, in this area. And lastly, it has also been challenging, of course, once the once the standards had been set, uh, to also ensure that they were uh, met and maintained. Uh, so basically, the commitment would be maintained in the long run. Uh, so this, as well, has has been had to solve uh, to solve to be solved through a close engagement with the different stakeholders uh, involved in the process. Um, and with regard to the success factors that have determined the uh, the incredible results achieved by the program. Uh, first of all, uh, the uh, endorsement from the top management and the board of the CM Cement Group has been key. Um, and also, secondly, uh, the fact that before implementation, a clear system, a clear management system had been put in place, um, which was key to also ensure the success of the program uh, until today and will be key also to ensure its success in the future, in the long run. Um, thirdly, um, the fact that the CM Cement Group really committed strongly to developing communication, tra training and awareness programs to raise awareness about this new initiative was also very important to determine its success. And, um, and lastly, also the close engagement uh, it maintained with its suppliers uh, was very important as they not only were eva evaluated, but also help was provided to help them overcome their challenges and uh, comply with the criteria that had been set. So I will very quickly move on to the second case study I'm going to mention, which corresponds to the to case study three in the compendium. Um, so this case study focuses on the public procurement of green textbooks um, in China. So the so China has one of the largest and fastest growing printing <coughs> industries in the world. Uh, however, most companies still resort to traditional and highly polluting technologies that produce volatile organic compounds, so VO VOC, as well as a lot of uh, solid waste emissions uh, as well. Um, so in order to address this issue of environmental pollution, the Ministry of Environmental Protection and the State Administration of Press, Publication, Radio, Film and Television uh, jointly launched the uh, Green Printing Programme. Um, to systematically reduce the impact of modern printing processes on the environment as well as on citizens' health. Um, and it was within uh, the framework of the Green Printing Program that the project on school textbooks was launched. Um, so the, um, the, uh, this, this project aims to, um, aims to green the whole production of textbooks uh, for middle, for primary and middle school students uh, across the whole con the, the whole country of China, with a one hundred percent coverage, and because there are sixteen point uh, five million primary and middle school students in China, and because the project co covers all of them, you can imagine the huge potential this program has to reduce the environmental impacts related to the entirety of the printing industry. Um, so the initiative was launched in May two thousand and thirteen. And um, the way it worked was that so the, the state council covers the cost of the school books um, and also 
uh, picks the uh, the printing companies that are going to to supply the books, and these companies have to uh, hold the have to live up to the environmental labeling certification in order to be eligible to um, to supply these books. Um, also, the paper has to be uh, officially recognized by uh, one of the international organizations that deal with forestry certifications. And the ink and glues also have to meet the criteria set by the Ministry of, of Environmental Protection. And the award decision, the, decision uh, the final decision, is based on the quality of the printing as well as the price. And some of the factors are linked to, of course, everything that comes before, during, after the printing, the, the production process. Um, and uh, and um, the energy consumptions and uh, emission of pollutants, as well as the recycling and handling of raw and auxiliary material. Um, so the monitoring is conducted by the uh, local provincial administration for press and publications. And they also conduct then regular checks to uh, make sure that the supplies meet the standards set by the Green Printing Programme. There's also an inspection team that is formed by the State Administration of Press, Publication, Radio, Film and Television of China, together with the Minister of Education and the Ministry of Environmental Protection. And lastly, there are laboratories that certify the printing quality of the textbooks and make sure that they live up to the uh, standard of green printed books. Um, so for now, the, uh, until at the end, by the end of 2015, there were seven publishing houses and 11 printing companies that had uh, that had uh, complied with the uh, program's criteria. And um, according to the statistics provided by 30 provinces, there are approximately 71% of primary and secondary school textbooks that have been issued following the practices. Uh, set by the Green P Printing Program in 2013, and also uh, very large reductions in the uh, cost of the printing industries have been uh, registered as well, uh, thanks to uh, savings with, uh, with regard to electricity, water, ink, and paper. So some of the challenges that had to be overcome to uh, achieve these results were linked to both the economics of it, because of course. Um, having um, choosing uh, environmentally friendly material rather than standard material, of course, uh, means incurring at least upfront higher costs. And also, there have been technical challenges because the production processes have had, have had to be adapted to the new criteria. And in this regard, the uh, CEC has helped uh, a lot with the training programs uh, for the suppliers. And um, there have been, of course, benefits, as already mentioned, both for the suppliers themselves in terms of reduced costs um, and also for the environment overall. So with reduced uh, emissions from the printing companies, as well as uh, high levels of energy saving and reduced consumption in the production process. So thank you very much. This was the end of this presentation about the case studies. So I think we can now move on to the question and answer session, which is going to be uh, moderated by Farid. Thanks, Laura. And before that, I would like to take the opportunity to uh, thank and congratulate our colleagues from the Green Purchasing Network Malaysia, who have uh, led the process of development of those case studies together with the UN Environment and uh, did really a great job. Thanks a lot. Do we have any... Uh, Questions? Anyone wants to uh, ask a question? So you can raise your hand in case you have a question. I don't see anyone, any question on uh, in our uh, window. And I don't see any hand raised. Unless, uh, oh, I have to go up here. Oops, sorry. Uh, go down. Okay. Please raise your hand. You have this possibility on the go to webinar uh, control panel to raise your hand in case you want to ask a question. And you can also 
write a dedicated question in a specific box. We're going to give yourself, we're going to give ourselves one more minute. And if we don't have any question, then we'll be happy to close the webinar. And uh, of course, you will receive all the presentation, the link basically to uh, this webinar, which is being recorded and will be uploaded on our YouTube channel. Well, I think we have been very clear. We, we thank you all. We wish you a good holiday season and uh, we'll be in touch next year, I guess, for uh, further exchanges on this topic. So thank you, Yim. Thank you here, colleagues from UN Environment, Laura, Milis, and uh, our Laura Guccioni also for having attended and we have the thanks also coming through the control panel from Yim. Bye bye everyone. Thanks a lot.